The movie starts with a carefree middle-aged physical therapist, Leslie Wright, preparing breakfast for her father before leaving the house. She drives her beat-up old Mustang to her office and the viewers are treated to breathtaking aerial shots of New York City as somber upbeat music plays in the background. Leslie arrives at her office, where everyone loves her. After a tiring day, sunset rolls around. Leslie gets dressed and leaves the office, off to a date. As she gets to the restaurant, she asks the valet for help opening the door. The valet tries to open the banged-up door. He falls. Leslie gets out and heads in. She meets a handsome man named Mark, and they instantly hit it off. After a long and pleasant night of drinking and talking, they walk out. Leslie begins planning for the second date, but Mark is reluctant. He states that he is unavailable because of a recent breakup. Leslie understands but is frustrated on the inside, driving home in a fed-up mood. Leslie's best friend and god sister, Morgan, is staying in her guest room. Morgan is a 30-year-old, fairly attractive woman who is obsessed with marrying an NBA player, and spends hours of her time studying about NBA players' wives. She is determined to do so and has lost her job and car in the process. They have a chat about Leslie's date before heading off to bed because they have to go to a basketball game the next day. Early next morning, Leslie and Morgan begin to dress for the game. Leslie dons a Nets jersey while Morgan is much more dressy, sporting a fancy dress. The game is completely carried by starting point guard Scott Manite, who scores point after point after point. Scott leaves no stone unturned, bestowing humiliating defeat upon the opposing team. He shows an exceptional performance, and the New Jersey Nets beat the Orlando team by a landslide. Leslie, being a die-hard Nets fan, quips from the bleachers and is delighted by her team winning the match. After the match, Manight is approached by reporters, inquiring about his plans for the future as he will be a free player after this season ends. Manight shows interest in retaining the Nets membership. Morgan leaves with her friends to go to a victory celebration with the team. They show interest in heading to Manite's birthday party on the coming city, but are unable to secure invites. That night, Leslie encounters none other than Scott Manite at a gas station. Scott is talking on the phone. He is unable to figure out the fuel door on his new Mercedes. Leslie walks over and lends him a hand. They start talking and have a lengthy conversation. Scott thanks Leslie and invites her to his birthday party, the same one the girls were talking about. Leslie informs Morgan about the invite, who jumps up and down in excitement and begins planning for the day. When the day arrives, Leslie and Morgan are anxious yet excited to go to the party. Leslie's mother hands her some special earrings and asks that either she or Morgan wear them. These are the same earrings Leslie's grandmother wore when she met her grandfather. Her mother also wore them when she met Leslie's father. Morgan quickly puts them on. Leslie's father lends her his car and the two drive off. The party is a banger, with all the NBA stars and high rollers present. All of the attendees propose a toast to Scott, commending him for not letting fame change him. Scott is a gentleman, same as he was before he hit it big. After the toast, Scott finds Leslie and thanks her for showing up. Leslie gives him a card before being interrupted by Morgan. Morgan makes up a fake story about needing to leave. She quickly grabs Scott's attention, who is desperate to talk to her. Morgan shuts the conversation down, as a trick to make Scott fall for her even more. The trick starts working. Scott shows up to Leslie's house early next morning, wanting to see Morgan. Leslie invites him inside and calls for her. Being the fake, selfish person she is, Morgan quickly crawls out of bed, changes her outfit and comes downstairs, wanting to sell the whole I don't care persona. Scott asks her out to dinner. But Morgan, still insistent on playing hard to get, declines. After some convincing from Scott, she agrees. Morgan and Scott eventually begin a relationship. As his career starts going uphill, so does his relationship with Morgan. Months pass and Morgan moves into Scott's lavish mansion, finally achieving the materialistic and elite lifestyle she had dreamt of for so long. The NBA All-Star playoffs are at the gates, and Scott Manite has been chosen to represent Team East for the sixth time in a row. Delighted, Scott throws a party where Leslie is also invited. Leslie catches up with Morgan after several months. Morgan has adjusted right into the comfortable and cozy lifestyle that comes with dating a world-class basketball player. She shows Leslie around the mansion. During the tour, the friends come to Scott and Morgan's bedroom, where Morgan reveals her plans to put up a nursery. Leslie inquires about the nursery, and Morgan confesses that Scott has changed her, by making her believe in true love and realizing how wrong she was before. She reveals her resolve to marry Scott and start a family. Leslie is still somewhat confused after hearing this because she knows Morgan inside out. But Morgan defuses Leslie and the pair head downstairs. At the peak of the party Scott proposes a toast and grabs everyone's attention. With everyone now focused towards Scott, he proposes to Morgan with a Cartier diamond ring. Morgan, of course, says yes and the couple get engaged right there and then. Scott's mother expresses concern on his behavior, citing that he hasn't even known Morgan for that long, yet has engaged with her. But Scott ignores it and carries on. Morgan becomes known as the most beautiful woman in the world, something Scott calls her. She is on the cover of countless magazines and on a lot of talk shows, now being recognized as the woman who stole Scott Manite's heart. The All-Star playoffs are finally here. Scott and the East team start strong, mustering 100 points before halftime. 
but in the second half, Scott trips and falls on his knee during a rebound. He is in excruciating pain and is unable to get up. The world starts spinning around him and the team gathers round. The commentators term that this injury could be career-threatening. Medical personnel reveal the cause to be a torn PCL. Scott is unable to play with the bad knee and is extremely disappointed in himself. His team immediately gets him the best physical therapist in the sports industry, Bella Goldsmith, also known as the Miracle Worker. Scott is needed to be fit fast in order for the next season trails, or else he could risk losing his place at the Nets roster. Bella Goldsmith arrives at Scott's mansion. She is an extremely attractive blonde woman. Morgan's insecurity gets the best of her and she gets Bella fired after only one day on the job. The position is given to Leslie instead. Leslie wins over Scott's mother as soon as she comes into Scott's house. She begins Scott's treatment. Later, Morgan is seen working out at the gym while Leslie gives Scott a knee massage. The massage causes him discomfort but he pushes through. Scott falls down right as he gets up. Morgan shows her fake concern by deliberately taking her time while coming to Scott's aid, and asks if he's okay. As Leslie helps Scott into the other room, Morgan expresses disgust at his inability to even walk properly. Leslie and Paul, a friend of hers and Morgan, are having lunch, right when Morgan joins them. Leslie asks her about Scott's condition. Morgan is unable to give a straight answer because she was too busy shopping. Leslie gets the hint that the relationship might not last too long. And she is right. Morgan slowly starts detaching from Scott. All she does is spend money and shop for useless designer clothes, jewelry, etc. One morning, a friend of Scott's comes to visit. He reveals that there is a rumor that the Nets might not sign Scott again, unless he is able to make a comeback fast. This takes a heavy toll on Scott's psyche. One afternoon, Scott inquires from Leslie about Morgan's whereabouts. Leslie reveals she has no idea. Morgan has stopped picking up Scott's calls or messages. Scott turns up a news show which states that Scott making an NBA comeback is nearly impossible. As Scott's relationship with Morgan starts to deteriorate, so does his mental well-being. His treatment starts coming to a standstill and things start looking bad for his recovery. One fateful morning, Scott wakes up to find a letter and a ring box awaiting him on the side table. It's from Morgan. She returned the ring and called off the engagement. Scott is baffled, and spends the entire day in his room by himself. As Leslie comes to the house, she is greeted by Scott's upset mother. She berates Morgan and goes on to proclaim that her suspicions about son's fiancé were true. Leslie is infuriated, and drives right to her house to confront Morgan. Leslie yells at Morgan for leaving Scott when he needed her the most, and being a selfish gold digger who only cared about her own materialistic needs. She calls out how Morgan was lying when she said Scott had changed her. She is still a gold digger who chases fame and money as she always was. Leslie tries to make her feel bad but Morgan won't budge. She tells Leslie that she has bigger ambitions and can't be stuck being the wife of an NBA husband. Leslie feels bad as she knows this lifestyle of using people for their wealth will one day surely catch up with Morgan. Back at his house, Scott is sulking with loneliness, staring mindlessly at the ceiling lying on his bed while highlights of his career play in the background. There is a knock on the door. It is Leslie. She pleads with Scott to eat something but Scott angrily shouts at her to go away. She prepares lunch for Scott and leaves it at the doorstep, not wanting to disturb his incessant grieving. Elsewhere, Leslie closely examines Scott's injury. She is determined to get him up and running and at his old performance in time for the next season playoffs. Scott, still drunk and depressed, is seen lying down in his room, unwilling to talk to anyone. One morning, Leslie marches into Scott's room with a bucket of ice. She dumps some ice on Scott and asks him to get up immediately. Scott angrily resists, but Leslie will not take no for an answer. She dumps more ice on Scott, startling him. She asks again and Scott declines again. Right as Leslie is about to flip the bucket of ice on Scott's head for the third time, he gets up and gets dressed. The duo get in Leslie's beat-up Mustang and arrive at Scott's home ground. The ground where he used to play as a young boy with a dream to join the NBA one day. The ground where little Scotty became Scott Manite. Halkum Rucker Basketball Courts. As they arrive there, Scott is delighted to be at his home turf one more time. He sees the kids playing there and imagines himself as one of them, back when times were simpler. Leslie helps him get out and the pair head onto the courts. All the kids are amazed to see the legend among them and gather around. One of the kids challenges Scott to a dunk and Scott quickly accepts. Little by little, Scott's knee starts improving. Leslie incorporates heavy training exercises and cardio into Scott's routine which helps his knee become more fluid. Day by day, Scott's condition improves. And in between all the rigorous training, Leslie and Scott find themselves getting closer to each other. They occasionally have heartfelt conversations with each other, such as the story behind the dent on Leslie's Mustang, a leaner, or how her grandfather used to have a dimple on his left cheek. Scott also shares his deepest insecurities and regrets with Leslie, like him missing his absent father and wanting to know him. He secretly yearns to see if his father would be proud of what his son has achieved. During a card game one night, Leslie reveals to Scott that she is single. Scott reacts very surprised, adding that Leslie is a perfect woman, funny, smart, attractive, and most importantly, genuine. Leslie laughs it off but is interrupted by repeated sneezing. 
pointing towards a severe cold. Meanwhile, playoffs arrive. Scott is able to win over the judges by showing major improvement. Now, the judges show signs of interest towards re-signing him for the Nets next season. At this point, the only thing that will determine if Scott McKnight can make a comeback or not is a final game, playoff match 7. Meanwhile, as Leslie falls sick, Scott cares for her. He brings her soup and tea and feeds her by his hand. Leslie thanks him and falls asleep right next to him on the couch. While watching TV, Scott also drifts off to sleep on Leslie's shoulder. Sometime later at night, Scott wakes up and looks at Leslie with affectionate eyes. He tucks her in the blanket and turns off the TV before going to bed. Days pass, and the game is just 16 hours away. Late at night, Leslie brings marshmallow and chocolate chip cookies to Scott's bedroom, and notices piano noises coming from the secret room. The room was previously declared off-limits by Scott towards Morgan. Leslie enters the room and finds Scott playing the piano, one of his hidden talents. Leslie shows amazement towards this exceptional ability. To her surprise, Scott reveals that he is very shy about playing piano. Leslie settles right in with the fact and asks him to play something. As Scott plays the instrumental, Leslie sings the lyrics. The pair have a good time and Leslie asks Scott to try the treats she brought. Scott initially refuses but Leslie hands one to him and to his surprise, he loves it. Scott wants to try another one but Leslie doesn't let him, and all the fighting eventually leads up to them being closer. Scott's eyes suddenly change, and Leslie senses it. The pair head off to sleep and prepare for the next morning. The sparkle in Scott's eyes is finally back, and so is his charm on the court. At the IZUD Center, the Nets' home turf, everyone is surprised and anxious to see Manite back in the game. Manite goes up to one of his friends on the opposite team, Dwayne Wade, and the pair exchange greetings and hope for a good game. This game will decide if the New Jersey Nets will make it into the NBA Finals for the first time in eight years, so there is tremendous pressure on every player, especially Scott. The whistle blows, and both sides fight for control over the ball. Orlando Heat starts off strong, with Wade and Kummert repeatedly scoring. Scott's game sense has diminished due to not playing for so long. But nonetheless, he makes throws and keeps taking rebounds. He repeatedly aims for the hoop but narrowly misses. There is disappointment among the bleachers. The fans are booing Scott Manite in the nets. Scott snatches the ball from Wade and makes another throw, adamant to score. As he lands, he puts great pressure on his knee, and the referee calls for a timeout. Frustrated, Scott takes a seat and blames his knee for failing him. Leslie notices all this from the bleachers and walks to the courtside. She reminds Scott that there is too much at stake for him to give it up now. She tells her that anything he wants to do can be done, while also telling him the importance of self-belief. With this newfound sense of confidence, Scott walks on court with a chest swollen with credence. The team huddles up and devises the plan to snatch victory in the second half. Scott does wonders with the ball, but right as the clock announces the remaining 15 seconds, the score is 104 to 106. The Nets need three points to qualify for the NBA Finals. Scott takes possession of the ball and shoots a half-court shot with two seconds left on the clock. All the players in the audience are either looking at the ball or at Manite. All of it becomes a slow-motion blur as the ball enters the hoop and boom. A game-winning victory for the New Jersey Nets, courtesy of Scott Manite. Scott is quickly raised on the shoulders of the team as the commentators announce his comeback. Post-match, all of the reporters and news personnel invite Scott to various talk shows and podcasts. He approaches his mother and hugs her before locking eyes with Leslie. They embrace. Leslie tells Scott that his performance was phenomenal. Scott thanks Leslie for all her work and asks her out to dinner the following night. Next night, Scott eagerly waits for Leslie to come down, donning a tuxedo. Leslie comes down dressed in a beautiful blue dress. This stuns Scott, as this is probably the first time he has seen Leslie dress like that. They exchange a few words before heading out to dinner. The dinner serves as a medium for Scott and Leslie's true feelings, and they have a great time together. Terence Blanchard is Leslie's favorite musician, and Scott arranged for him to be there especially to make the night even more memorable. As they come back home, Scott tells Leslie to expect a surprise. He covers Leslie's eyes and walks her to what seems to be a car wrapped in a red cover. As the cover comes off, a completely rebuilt and sparkling Aliner, Leslie's Mustang, emerges from within. Scott has had the car completely rebuilt fitted with sophisticated contemporary features such as a sunroof, digital panel, fingerprint door handles as well as butterfly doors. All while keeping the dimple on the left door that, like she mentioned, reminded her of her grandfather. Leslie is at a loss for words, and quickly climbs into the car. She tells Scott she cannot thank him enough, but he replies that making him her first passenger would be more than enough. Scott opens the door for Leslie to get out. Right as she gets out, she gives Scott a peck on the cheek before pulling away. Scott is unable to hide his true intentions anymore. He leans in and kisses Leslie passionately. The couple end up making love inside Scott's house and fall asleep. Leslie wakes up the next morning to find Scott gone and a lavish breakfast awaiting her in bed, accompanied by a note from Scott. Ecstatic upon finally finding the right man, Leslie does a funny dance in bed and dives right into the waffles Scott made. 
The doorbell rings and Leslie comes downstairs to answer. She is both amazed and shocked to see no one other than Morgan at the door. She invites her in and Morgan reveals she wants to talk to Scott. Leslie informs her Scott is not there. Moments pass before Scott enters. He is taken aback from seeing Morgan inside the house. Morgan shows fake sympathy and mentions commitment issues as an excuse for leaving Scott earlier and does a whole teary-eyed drama to win back his love. Scott, still shattered from her treachery yet extremely gullible, tells her to leave and give him some time. Leslie eavesdrops on this conversation from behind a pillar and begins packing her things to head back home. Scott inquires her reason for leaving, but she is too mad to say anything. Scott tells her that he never wanted to hurt her, and he had to consider being with Morgan because three months ago this was the woman he was thinking of marrying. Leslie tells him that all she has ever been was a friend and never a priority, and storms off. Leslie is heartbroken. She makes some impulsive decisions to soothe her ache, like randomly painting the walls of her house. Soon, she is joined by her father, who shows remarkable support by giving Leslie time to process everything that happened. At her job, Leslie announces to her colleagues that she is going to be an athletic trainer with the NBA. Meanwhile, Scott finally sees Morgan as who she really is, a narcissistic materialistic gold digger. She orders the most expensive champagne on the menu despite hating it. She also proposes to Scott to get married next month, but Scott shuts down the conversation as a whole. While Scott is playing the piano, Morgan shuts the door. He remembers Leslie singing on the piano with her, and misses her. He finally realizes that the right partner is not someone who is not just physically attractive, but rather someone who understands him as a whole. Concurrently, Leslie starts receiving calls from various teams to be a part of their athletic team, including the Phoenix Suns, Philadelphia 76ers and the New Jersey Nets. Leslie is thrilled, but her joy quickly fades away because she realizes she cannot work for the Nets, her favorite team because it means being close to Scott all the time. Scott's manager tells him that he has gotten a new five-year contract with the Nets, and that his new client, Leslie Wright, is seriously considering an offer with the 76ers. Scott's face goes dark, and he nods in approval. Some time later, at a talk show, Scott finally confesses his love for Leslie live on television. He paints Leslie as someone who believed in him when no one did. Someone who stood by his side when there was no hope left for him. Someone who gave him hope for his bleak future. He takes off the mic and apologizes to the host before leaving the set. He quickly tells Morgan, who is sitting right offset, that all of this is not going to work out. To the viewer's surprise, Morgan finally does her first selfless act in the movie. She informs Scott that Leslie is in Philadelphia. She wishes Scott good luck as he catches a flight to Philadelphia. On the other hand, Leslie is seen having a tour with the 76ers manager. Everything is almost finalized, and Leslie asks for some time to think the deal through. She walks out and sees Scott standing beside the stairs, wanting to meet her. She is angry at Scott and blames him for treating her like a plan B but Scott reveals he broke up with Morgan. He is willing to leave the Nets to be with Leslie. He will be with her wherever she goes. Because he cannot let another day go by without having Leslie by his side. Leslie is just right for him. Leslie says nothing and makes a call. The call connects to Tim, Leslie and Scott's manager. Leslie tells him to sign the deal with the Nets. Scott is ecstatic, and the pair can join in a kiss. Next season rolls around, and Morgan and Leslie are seen sitting courtside at a Nets 5 Heat game. Leslie is now an athletic trainer within the New Jersey Nets team. Someone boos Scott, to which Leslie replies her husband will dunk on the heats, indicating that she and Scott are married. The Nets lose the game, and Leslie rushes on the court, expecting to find a devastated Scott. She is greeted by a massive smile on his face instead. He reveals that he is grateful to have her and the couple hug each other. They may have lost a match but it feels like they've won in life. 